My name's Tim Gillard. I'm 70 years old and I founded Gillard Racing Karts. My father, from what I understand, was um, passionate about cars and motorsport and uh, from a very young age. When he was a schoolboy, he used to get three buses to cross London to actually go and watch the racing at Brooklands, which at the time was the only permanent track in the UK. And um, his mother would make him up a pack of sandwiches to take with him. And he was so keen on getting there and enthusiastic and he'd spend the whole day watching the cars and come home on the three buses and get home and the packet of sandwiches was still unopened in his rucksack. Obviously, with that enthusiasm he had, it was almost natural that it was going to be passed on to me. And then I remember, when I was a child still, being taken to a child's exhibition in London. They had this small track laid out and electric carts going round. Obviously, I'd never seen a cart before, so queued up with a lot of other children, eventually had my turn and I can't remember how long we had now, five minutes or something going around this track. But it was such a revelation to me to be actually sitting in something that um, powered and you could steer it and had a little break on it, I think, from memory. It's an experience I didn't forget. My parents were brought up, I suppose, in an age or when I was brought up with the fact that uh, if you wanted something, you had to save up for it. And from that day on with the electric carts, I thought to myself, hmm, I'd really like a car to my own, but uh, having to save meant that saving pocket money and money from any odd jobs or anything like that. Gradually, I saved enough and uh, bought a second-hand Techno rolling chassis for £30. It was not the same Techno company that make carts now. It was a company in Bologna run by the Pedazzani brothers who actually went on to make a Formula One Techno car. But so then I had the cart and it sat in the garage for a year, 18 months or so, but it couldn't go anywhere because it didn't have an engine. Gradually saved my money again, managed to then save enough to buy a second-hand Perilla S13 engine, I think for £25. So then I had the complete package. My father wasn't very keen on uh, us going to the Rye House at weekends because it was very busy in those days. He, and um, the practice was much more of a free-for-all. So uh, he took some time off in our school holidays, the odd day, and I went to the track and practiced at Rye House. The techno really was a bit old and also at that time there wasn't much junior racing in the country. Even though we were pra practiced a lot with the cart, it was really necessary to have a more up-to-date cart. And by then my father could see that he um, was really interested and passionate about it and it was something that obviously he then felt it was worth pursuing. With money I'd saved and managed to sell the techno cart for a little bit of money as well, he helped me buy a brand new Devonson Sprint cart, which from memory I think was 120 pounds. So then had a much more up-to-date and competitive cart to actually go racing with. Didn't really ever do any big national races or anything like that. We just did local races had a reasonable amount of success, won a few trophies, but money was always a little bit of a problem. And I remember one particular race at Rye House where we actually finished the race and there was canvas showing through on the rear tyre. But in those days, it wasn't like now where people were forever putting new tyres on. You actually used the tyres till there was no holes left. And even though I enjoyed the driving side and the racing to a certain extent, somehow I always enjoyed the engineering side more on preparing the cart and I suppose that was something that um, was going to really stand me instead, even though I didn't know it at the time, for the career I was going to pursue. I 
it wasn't really necessarily my intention to actually go into karting, but after school, which I didn't really enjoy a great deal, I went to engineering college, which I greatly enjoyed. And in fact, for one year, I was um, awarded the Castrol Trophy, which was given to the students showing the best practical ability. And then while I was at the college, it was normally a three and a half year course, something like that. And I think I was in my last year. And the principal approached me one day and he said, um, would you be interested in taking a sabbatical for, say, six months from the college? then come back after the six months and finish your course because we've had an approach from an ex-pupil who's now manager of the Firestone Formula One racing tyre division and they're looking for a youngster to help out during the Grand Prix for um, the European season. So basically I said, oh, of course, and sort of jumped at <laughs> the the opportunity thinking this would be fantastic and what they actually needed was in those days the tar engineers were very instrumental in the way they set up the cars and there was a big war going on at the time between Goodyear and Firestone and about half the teams on the Formula One grid were contracted to Firestone and the other half contracted to Goodyear and basically I presume it's the same with Goodyear but with Firestone they had one engine tyre engineer per team who used to advise a lot, not only on the angles of the, the cambers and the caster angles and things like that, but also on the spring rates and the wing settings. It was all done by them looking at the tyre and also taking the tyre temperatures across the tyre. And they'd look at the tyre to see how well it was performing, whether it was graining or anything like that. And for some reason that year, I believe it's 1972, 70, I think it was 72, BRM, who were contracted to Firestone, decided they were going to run five cars. So the poor engineer just couldn't cope with all the work. And they really wanted a youngster just to help him out with more of the sort of the basic stuff of making sure the tires were in the right place and the right tires were mounted on the right wheels for particular drivers. So it was much more of a gopher situation, but it was a fantastic experience being actually in the Formula One paddock. And I'll never forget at Brands Hatch, which held the British Grand Prix that year, um, the truck where all the tires were fitted was outside in the main paddock. And it was quite a long walk through the tunnel till you got to the pits where the cars were based. And the number of times I was walking back over and forwards during the weekend with trolleys laden with tyres from the paddock to the pits was unbelievable. Anyway, that finished and I went back to college and finished my course. And my intention had been to go back to Firestone and try and get a full-time job there. But unfortunately, from what I can recall, they were starting to cut back on their racing operation at that time and actually were making some people redundant. So there wasn't really any opportunity to go back. But I'd been bitten by sort of working in motorsport. And um, there was a company not that far from where we lived uh, called Brian Hart Racing Engines in Harlow. And so I applied to them and managed to get a job. Again, it was very much as an apprentice. Um, I mean, I think for my first six months or so, all I was doing was building oil pumps intending to be driving the company car around, picking up spare parts. But gradually I progressed and eventually was taught how to start building actual race engines. Uh, he mainly concentrated on um, Formula Atlantic engines, which I suppose is the equivalent to the current Formula 3, and Formula 2 engines, and quite a few rally engines for um, Ford Motor Company in Boreham. It was okay, but... It was difficult because I, I didn't really enjoy the job that much. One of the problems being that a lot of the other people there were married, had mortgages. They wanted to work every hour possible, which pleased Brian Hart no end. Whereas being quite young still, I wanted to come home. We were still karting at the time and prepare the cart or even go down the pub with my friends. So it was never really gelled that well with Mr Hart. But... Anyway, one day, 
as I say, I was still carting. Paul Deven of Devensons um, prepared the engines for me. And I remember taking over an engine that needed a rebuild and arriving at their workshop at uh, Rye House and went in and couldn't believe it. There was about 20, 25 engines sitting there all ready to be rebuilt, or waiting to be rebuilt. I'm talking to him, I knew him quite well anyway, Paul Deven, but um, in the conversation it was obvious that he was under a lot of pressure because not only did he have those engines to rebuild but also brand new ones to prepare and tune. And he turned around and said to me, he said, well you're involved in engines, would you fancy a job working here doing the engines? So as I wasn't that particularly happy doing working at Brian Hart, so I jumped to the opportunity because it was my hobby as well combining um, work. So I started working there and showed me how to rebuild the engines and eventually tune the engines. And it ended up with not only did I do the engine work, but I ended up mechanicking and went to a lot of the big races in the UK, plus races in Europe, and even went to Hong Kong. Generally enjoyed that side of it, even though I wasn't really involved in the carts. I started Gillard Carts. In fact, originally it was called Gillard Engineering on the 1st of March, 1980. By that time, I'd been at Davidson's for about five years and gradually had more responsibility in the company. It got to the stage where I was given keys for opening up and lock in the morning and locking up at night. And I ended up with um, customers who really were just dealing with me. They'd ring up and speak to me on the phone and come and collect their engines. And it almost felt like I was had my own company within their company in some ways, even though obviously I wasn't taking the money from the customers. And I felt that um, unless I did something, I was probably still going to be stuck there for ages or forever. So I made the big decision to start on my own. About a week before I was supposed to start, I'd found this small factory which I was going to rent and somehow something went wrong and I can't remember now. Um, anyway, I lost the factory. I think they rented it to somebody else which was a bit of a blow, but actually it was a blessing in disguise because even though I'd worked everything out financially of what I was going to be able to afford, in all honesty, I probably wouldn't have been able to manage the rent in the first year because a lot of things crop up that you hadn't really imagined. So for the first year, I ended up working out of a small garage behind my parents' house, which was good financially, but obviously very limited in what we could do. When I'd started, it was always my intention. I wanted to make a chassis, even though I'd been involved mainly in engines. And the customers, a lot of the customers from Devens who I'd been dealing with followed me. So I had their engine work as a basis. And then um, started to try and make a cart, which was obviously difficult with just being in such a small premises. And I think in the first year, all we made was five carts, but um, at least it got it started. And then after about a year, I realized that, you know, I was going to have to find somewhere bigger if it's going to expand the business. I managed to find another small factory to rent, which I did. And um, gradually the business expanded and we started to sell a few more carts. But in 1985, my father realized that the business was becoming more of a proper business and the limitations of the factory we were in wasn't very conducive to trying to grow the business. And very kindly, he helped me actually purchase a factory. So um, that was a massive step, but it gave us a place which at the time was plenty big enough. And in fact, ended up staying there for 35 years and eventually um, as well by, I think, a, about uh, 10 years later, buying the factory next door. So we stayed in those factories till I decided to retire at the end of 2020.
Well, TG is my initials, and 17 is actually the number of models of carp we have homologated over the years. Originally, the first cart was at homologation was we called CIK01, and I kept with that sequence of numbers up to CIK010, by which time I was very involved with, the, with Peter de Bruin in Holland and Lotte Helberg. And tragically, which was 2005, Lotta was very ill and passed away. Uh, one of the last things she ever said to Peter was, oh, it'd be nice if you could ask Tim next time you homologate a cart whether he could call it a Charlotte. So when Peter asked me, obviously I agreed straight away because I had a very good relationship with them. And after that, we had a few models of cart we called various names, but I'd always preferred numbers. And by the time we got to the 14th model, I decided to then go back to numbers and also include my initials with it. So the um, cart was TG14, and that's carried through ever since to what is now the TG17.